quality, not quantity, is what we look for. <laughs> My name is Jean Bauer. I'm on the Library Programming Committee, and I'm very excited today to introduce Catherine. Um, I just wanted to read a piece, a little, just a couple of lines from one of her poems that really struck me that uh, to me is kind of the essence of what her work does. And it comes from her poem, The First Fall Warblers. The moss, deep green and soft against her palms, became a forest of tiny trees reaching for light. So I just love that. It brings back to me all kinds of childhood memories of sitting in the moss and looking at them and the little toy soldiers, and uh, it's just beautiful. Um, and what's really special, another thing that's special about Catherine is that she's a Connecticut poet. So it got her a BA and MA at UConn, right? And um, also taught middle and high school English for 22 years in Connecticut and lives in Ledger. So it's wonderful to have um, a local poet. Uh, just a couple of logistics, please. If you have cell phones or anything that's going to buzz, turn that off. Um, Catherine will share her poetry and her thoughts for about 45 minutes. We have Q&A and then uh, there are books for sale at the back. And if um, you want to have a prolonged conversation with Catherine, we ask you to do it outside because we have to clear out of the building so the cleaning crew can get here at six. So thank you and please help me in welcoming Catherine. Oops, I'm walking off with the mic. I do it every time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you to Carla, to Alyssa, to Jean and Sally, and to the Stonington Free Library for having me today, and to all of you who came out. And um, thank you to those who are watching the broadcast as well. I'll begin with First Fall Warblers, the poem that Jean referenced, she sees them arrive as a flock descend on the dogwood. They dip and bob like a mobile, blues and grays, gold yellows, black bars, white streaks, as they devour the glossy berries. As she watches, a childhood memory returns on a pine stump in a bed of moss. Her classmates' whispers left behind she sat unafraid. The moss, deep green and soft against her palms, became a forest of tiny trees reaching for light. She smelled the damp vigor of decay, heard birds calling, leaves grazing leaves, and muffled overhead a distant airplane. She noticed that in a ray of light, her hair was strand after strand after strand, watched her own chest rising, falling. The margins of her life dissolved. Now the warblers lift and leave the dogwood stripped of berries. She steps outside, draws in the stillness. Next is Luna Moth. This morning, as I roll down my driveway, my mind busy with lesson plans, I spot you angled against the black lamppost. I rarely see your kind, four wings, the green of promise, edged in pink, tender as hope. Beneath you, clematis climbs, its papery purple buds still tightly closed. If this is the first of your seven days, the buds will have opened like hands by the time you pass to darkness. If the last, I am witness to your clinging. Somewhere, although the world ceases as I watch you, a pair of siblings is called into a kitchen. For a wishbone contest, only one of them will win. Near a field of poppies being harvested for opium, an egg case hangs like a thumb of glazed pastry. Amid fragrant hay inside a fairgrounds barn, a child sleeps head against her dairy cow. And in a canyon, a rattlesnake, patient, coiled, motionless, waits for vibration. 
By the time I reach the highway, I understand my longing to feel your vast green around me and its futility, pink and raised as a scar. Uh, this next poem considers, among other things, one of the losses resulting from our shift away from being an agrarian society. This is the snakeskin. Raised like a scar, my grandfather's name girdles the century-old milk bottle I am holding. Inside, a snakeskin. In its day, the bottle held milk from his cows. Late summers, the family men moved bales from field to wagon to hayloft. With relentless, relentless drive and strength born of strength used, my uncle tossed the bales as a child might toss blocks into a storage box. As a boy, his vocal and motor tics meant he could not concentrate in school. Some afternoons, he would be sent home. But in the field and barn, with the workhorses and the cows, all that neural firing was channeled. Is it true the snakeskin came from the barn and that he found it on a rafter in the loft? True, partly true, stories get passed on. Maybe just their bones matter anyway, and the directions encoded in the genes. So we tell the stories that bring my uncle back to us. So my sons tick too. Harder these days for such boys, coiled with itch and energy, with no set way to wriggle out of their skins. You have this next poem. This is Iris's. And just a little context for you. Uh, the 20th century artist Joseph Albers said that in dealing with color relativity, it is practical to distinguish factual facts from actual facts. One's perception of a patch of, say, red by itself would be what he would consider factually factual. And one's perception of that same patch of red placed side by side with, say, a patch of green would be actually factual in Albers's view, in that this perception of the red would be altered by its proximity to the other color. This is irises. This close-up photograph of a dog's eye sends me to the old supplies, paper, paste, pen, ink, knife. I will cut her iris of yellow-orange, stay factually factual in my choice of hues, I mean to discover, not express. For the swirling fur atop her orbit, I will tear paper crescents of the blackest hue, set them aside to stack around the iris later. For her pupil, a patch of black less saturated, like water shaded by woods. Then, see it seep across the iris edge. I will pull thin rivulets of ink let them bleed into the orange. For the hazy reflection as she gazes, an arc of silver foil from a chocolate bar. I want you to know the actual fact of your dog's eye or of your lover's, so that however briefly you feel what you see. As for me, I will savor the dark chocolate from the foil. But before I do, before I cut, and tear and paste and draw. I will set a clutch of just cut irises into a vase, the air surrounding them reacting to their presence, their presence to the air. Nothing is itself alone. Uh, this next poem examines a moment of realization. And it's a, a love poem holding on to him. He is shaving in the mirror by the open window when the sun catches a strand of hair upon his chest, glinting silver among the rest. She murmurs, he turns. She finds the strand, follows it, grazing his skin with her fingertip. 
She asks if there are more she has not noticed, finds several woven through the rush of hair across his groin. Within her, something tightens, throat to navel. The light above the mirror hums. From the shaded cliffs, their sons' voices drift through the window screen. But she is thinking of the day when she will see him slowly scuff his way into the den in moccasins, reach for the crossword on the table, bend, pat the dog, gently tug one velvety sable ear, then the other. At the window, check the outside temperature, turn, head for their bedroom, reappear, dress the same as yesterday to resume the chore he'd set aside last evening. Later, she watches as he walks down the driveway for the mail. He pauses, thinking of the orchard, she can tell. She gazes until she can see him clearly again, shoulders square, hair not yet white, watches for signs, tosses in their bed all night. In our younger days, some in my generation promised ourselves that we'd never say young people today. I do, though, find myself noticing and thinking about some of the differences in our points of view. This is baby gift. On my baptismal day, my godparents gave me a sterling silver cup on which my monogram and date of birth are still decipherable. Its dimpled bottom seems to suggest its smithy eased body to base the way a seamstress joins a full skirt to a bodice. Instead, it documents how, clutching the cup in my fat fist, I banged it on my wooden high chair tray. Now, young parents want to receive soothing sound machines for sleep or feeding bowls with suction cups for bottoms. After they and their children are gone, what useful object made to last will someone hold while thinking, she once held what I am holding now? And this is how to feed a child. Set on linen before the hungry child, a bleached sea star and a bifurcated rock. The five-fingered shell is something fragile she can care for, intriguing enough to kindle desire, enough like bone to build on, enough like bone to say, this was once alive. She will marvel at the rock, its ivory left and ebony right, and trace the russet vein between, push her thumbs into its hollows, curl her palm around its knobby shoulder, Use both hands to gauge its heft, her strength. Wonder what tomorrow's feast will be. The next poem is The Cake. This is a short one. Serve it under your magnolia, to your sons, to your daughter-in-law, to your small grandson, and to your husband just home from the hospital. Think of your mother wrapped now in papery skin who called you to the window when you were small to see birds and foxes and took you to the high meadow behind your house and showed you corn cobs the farmer left for deer. The cake is good, the blossoms magnificent. You pass on what? and while you can. Sometimes it's difficult to get out of one's own way. I speak from experience. This poem looks at a moment when nature provides the speaker a new perspective. This is the task. Carrying in her beak a twig three times her width a Carolina wren lands on the narrow perch of the birdhouse she has claimed in the dogwood tree. Again and again, she seems to be trying to push the twig through the birdhouse entrance. How can it not have snapped, I wonder, just before I realize she's acting on a plan. 
bracing the twig in her beak against the house. She slides it left, 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 until with a sudden sweep of russet head above tucked wings, she snugs the twig lengthwise against her body and disappears into the house. Some days the task too huge, the opening too small. I feel myself as driven as any nesting wren. I make the twigs fit however I can because these are my wings, my beak. With these and my resolve, I build the life I can. Uh, this next poem um, I wrote after looking at a photo that my friend Sarah sent me of a Queen Anne's lace in her yard. And this poem looks at a shift in perspective that comes with aging. The Sovereign. Is this blossom of Queen Anne's lace past her prime? Around her, like delicate parasols, others at their most enticing bob evasively at passers-by. But days ago, she sent her umbels curling forward into a seed head in which she prepared her progeny. Undulating and coiling, they form a cavern fit for echoing. I was young, I too enticed, but she is done inviting. Now her posture says, admire me or don't. This next poem you have as well, this is um, a different kind of logic. I'm going to give you some context here as well. My mother had a copy of Lebanese American writer Khalil Gibran's The Prophet when I was growing up. And my poem opens with this epigraph from the book. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. And at 97, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. As I was losing my father over the two more years that he lived, I watched my mother losing her husband. This is a different kind of logic. Again, my father says he wants to go home. Again, my mother tells him that they sold their home years ago. This is home now. Again and again, he asks her when they will go to bed, where they will sleep, what is next. Last night, he referred to my brothers and me as adopted, though we were not. And after 70 years together, he has begun to forget that he is married to my mother. She hands my father the phone in hopes my voice will soothe his spirits as it always has. He listens quietly as I tell him about my day. But when I tell him that his great-grandson spent all morning climbing, singing, and digging for dinosaur bones, my father cries out joyfully and declares, Do you know why he does these things? Because he has an eternal spirit of happiness. I recount the exchange to my exhausted mother. A moment passes. Haltingly, she speaks. He could always see, he could always recognize the spirit within a person. And he could see how that connected to something beyond what we can see. I take the chance she has offered. I wonder, Mom, if he means something other than the old house when he speaks of going home. And last night, when he called the boys and me adopted, maybe he meant it in the way Gabron suggests. In the stillness, before her duty love takes over, my mother is unburdened by a different kind of logic. As a child, I learned any number of prayers committed to memory, in other words, um, but there are different ways to pray. This is prayer in late November. She is partway through the Lord's Prayer before she realizes, since who art in heaven or so, she has been studying the titmice at the window feeder. 
She recognizes she is of two minds, the one connecting her act of watching to distraction and the one connecting it to God. She continues the prayer, but what matters is her focus on the birds. She notices what makes them titmice, tufted crests, strangely large black eyes, auburn, auburn flanked gray bodies, hard work, efficiency, resolve. Soon the ground will freeze. So bed made, dishes washed, laundry done. She retrieves her garden tools and heads outside. She clips brush, drags the debris into a shelter for the birds, pushes a rotting log over the hillside, transplants a beauty berry, cuts boughs of evergreens for her Christmas planters, pauses, looks for other prayers to finish while she still has light. And you have this next poem as well. This is What Matters. Excuse me. Early in the pandemic, my husband had a heart attack. I wrote this shortly after. What Matters. <clears throat> Excuse me. I cannot visualize your heart as it appears in the film of the intervention that saved your life. I cannot picture the still dying cells sloughing off or the inf inflammation that will not calm for weeks. But I can see my hand circling your warm chest, soothing and cooling the still hot embers of your damaged ventricle, my intent running like a current over your still beating muscle, new cells, new cells, new cells as your heart pumps its love-rich blood, as your strong body, your stubborn will, your joyful self rebuild what was so starved for oxygen two Saturdays ago. A year into the pandemic, the speaker of this next poem is searching for freedom from the demands of being vigilant. She makes a discovery along the way. This is replacing the kitchen table. Polished furniture reflected light in nearly every room of my childhood home. My mother valued pieces meant to last, protected them with coasters, pads, and tablecloths. In my own home, the finished table my husband and I had saved for as newlyweds held mugs of hot morning coffee, children's brimming tea party cups, bowls of steaming soups and stews, vases of houseplant cuttings and flowers, markers and crayons and paints and paste, but always underneath a pad and tablecloth. Now, I want freedom from protection's demands. I sand and paint its replacement, excuse me, I sand and paint and wax its replacement, a secondhand maple table with matching chairs and an extra leaf for when our grown children come to visit. My husband and I lift our once prized table by its corners and carry it outside. But when I remove the pad, I see it, a gauzy four inch water stain all those years of training boys to wipe up spills, peel back soggy tablecloths, lift the pad, check for dampness. Now the painted table stands beside the same west-facing windows for however many years we too have left. Something a bit lighter. is for my husband. Calendar girl. Like me, others might recognize your intellect, incisive and relentless. They too might sense your sweetness. And they, like me, might be drawn to your square shoulders and brown eyes. But only I am witness to your latest 
obsessions. Your discovery, for example, of fresh fruit rather than preserves on your peanut butter toast, followed by your treaties on berries versus stone fruits and your reveries on the taste of each as compared with that of their jam counterparts. And only I, freshly showered and having dropped my wet towel into the washer, only I, having grabbed a cold, ripe watermelon from the fridge beside it, the largest, roundest one we've had this season, only I, upon entering the kitchen naked, holding the specimen like a trophy, only I get your applause, followed by, well, there's a farm calendar photo. My final five poems um, are new. They're not in, in the book. The first three I will read are forthcoming in the literary journal Delmarva Review. I appreciate that the executive editor has given me permission to share the poems, even though the reading's being broadcast um, ahead of publication. Like the Sovereign, the one about the Queen Anne's Lace, the first poem presents a perspective on aging, though on a different aspect. A discernible decline in health. Now that it has begun, you want before, or at least a chance, one chance, to feel what you had. Would it, though, change anything that matters? Say it is granted. Maybe this happens. Everything you had before is revelation. Then your decline becomes discernible again, and okay, you go on that way and on that way and on that way, losing more thises and thats. Same as before. Maybe, though, in that moment before perception, too, begins to skew, you perceive the revelation as schematic, and quickly, before it dissolves, you design a template. Every morning, you enter all that you still have and let it all have, all, and let all that having accompany you like a brilliant soundtrack that keeps you in the here and now, knowing that your body will not lose or ache or fade or fail quite this amenably again. This next poem, um, well, I'll just say that there's nothing romantic about the process of losing someone. Uh, the grief and the related feelings that follow the loss are tough, and um, sometimes they're, they're pretty inelegant. This is unyielding love. Poetry, do not give me words like these, bittersweet, brambles, barren, thorns, vines, terrain, or these, light, stars, moon, burgeoning, birth, deliverance, soothe, navigate, praise. Nothing that signals that since you understand, you have a suggestion, an answer even. All I need to do is follow, is believe, is open my eyes, is be astounded by your life, my life, life, is accept that your wisdom can replenish the, not this word either, vessel that I am. Also, not gratitude, as in, gratitude will anchor you. I have seen, as if in a mirror on a curve, that what is coming is not stoppable, may in fact be a beginning. Today, I finished with soups and teas, with clean sheets and towels and antiseptic wipes, with nighttime waking and dosage schedules, with ice packs and heating pads, with reverent awe. What I have witnessed is what anchors me. Her last breaths, his open eyes not reflecting. And what fills me with the peace I think you mean when you say gratitude was caring for them, was believing that unyielding love was power. It is a cloud with nothing left below to water or shield.
uh, the next poem, it, the speakers, the poem speaker, and this is a sonnet, by the way, the poem speaker, after a period of anxiety, is tired, tired of dwelling in her head, of ruminating, of being caught in the grips of perseveration. She imagines that with her temperament, life in an earlier era might have suited her better. And note that uh, Biffins are a dark red variety of baking apple that we don't have in the United States. Prayer for perseveration. Daily laden skies, dense with sleet and snow, ice slit cobbled streets, rank with workhorse urine, fowl hanging in a butcher's window, trips to barter baskets, hex of Biffins. Infant slung in wool, snug against my chest. Fire low back home, hungry mouths to feed. Belly growing big, too much to do to rest. Rising on a shelf, sourdough to knead. Curds to wash again, pies to fill and bake. Wood to haul inside, cows to milk by dark. Fire to rekindle, eating meal to make. Young to put to bed, willow to debark. Give me a life of sweat and labor, bloody, instinct, necessity, a body, a body. At a Q&A, after reading this past winter, I was asked something that I'd not thought about before that moment. This poem came from that. At the Q&A. Where or from whom did you get permission to be a writer? How quickly the answer gathered itself and emerged through a sheer mantlet of lush green and tender blue. Blue, my father's favorite color. Beyond my mother's pulley clothesline, that sensible device from which late afternoon she'd bring in wicker baskets of fresh air. Beyond that clothesline, a carpet of green, and nestled within, a tree stump. One day, in damp white tea and tan pants flecked with wood chips, my father invited me outside. There, he led me past the clothesline, through the greens, to that stump. Sweet, woody, minty. Look, he said, this is for you, a little toadstool of your own. When you want to, you can, you can sit on it and think. Vast blue, crisp air, leaf by leaf green, beyond shaped shadows on broken light. But most of all, revelation. What I was prone to existed, had a name, was mine. Mine to tend, to explore, to exert, with care with abandon, with intent. And the last poem, I want to just give you a tiny bit of context. In the final stanza, I reference the poet Ted Couser as well as the title of one of his poems. This is intergenerational. Early morning, my grandson pitches fits against the bridle of no. No to another Avenger video. No to a cookie at 8.15. The wooden stairs pound. The hollow walls reverberate. Worn out, he makes his way back to the kitchen, to his father and grandfather, to their gentle voices. When I call, he climbs across my bed, eases his small body next to mine listens, furrowing his shallow brow. He tells me of his woes, the injustices he'd had to weather. He's not alone, I tell him. Recount the nose his father met when he was small and in this very house. No to cookies, no to favorite shows. The nose his great uncles and I faced from our parents in our day. My grandson loved my parents uniquely, with ready affection with wonder at their baggy skin and rolling walkers, with recognition of their devotion to him. 
speaks of missing them still. We review the alternatives to disturbing the peace. I tell him he is one of more, even as he is his own. Quiet. I kiss his nestled head. A moment later, looking up, he tells me that he had been enjoying breakfast until I called him in. Out of here, I tell him. From the doorway, he looks back and, when I wink and wave, tries not to smile. I listen for his footsteps fading in the hall, pick up my reading, turn the page. Wouldn't you know, Ted Coozer's The Very Old awaits me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Um, I'm sorry. I think it has. I, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, and and it, and in the other direction as well. Um, I think that I I just said to my husband the other day that I, I was reading a, a short story. Um, I said to him, every time I read fiction, I feel as if it helps me in my writing of poetry, and. Um, maybe because poetry is so condensed and, um, you know, the best words in the best order, as Susan Dobbins said, um, and fiction's farther away from that, that tight center. And I, in teaching fiction, I found myself kind of mesmerized at times by what a really good writer would do to set the reader up for the rest of the experience. And so I think that, um, and, and then, you know, helping my kids to understand that and to, to see that if something seemed odd or out of place, if it was a really good writer, that was going to matter later. And they should set that aside. Instead of dismissing it, they should set it aside and, and keep it and know that they'll need it later and that later on they'll be able to connect a lot of those things. And, and so I think that has made me more um, aware as I'm writing, especially a narrative, of the order in which I want certain facts or sensory details um, presented. And that idea of, you know, English teachers so often are teaching their kids in their own writing that they need to consider their audience. They always need to remember that they're writing for someone who's going to be reading. And um, so I think that, you know, in both directions, that has helped me quite a bit as a as a writer, because I'm, um, even as I'm recording something, you know, following some impulse that I have, whether it's something that I notice that I know has something in there I need to figure out, whether I'm going for my own discovery and at the same time sharing that with the reader, or whether I'm trying to tell a story, um, as I go through draft after draft after draft, I'm aware of those things that. Um, that were I, I felt really important in, in what I taught to my students in an effort to um, improve their literacy skills and their writing skills. So that answers it for you. It's a great question. Anybody else? No's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much.